what you're looking at here is an actual wine light. Well, not really, but the process they used back in the old days, which is the process of using oxyhydrogen to heat a piece of wine to incandescence. Not a very uh, effective method. You're looking at about a 600 watt light bulb. <laughs> now you can probably get it a little brighter. Looks like I'm about ready to blow my tip up. I'm not careful there. Kind of see the shadow that it casts. It is really bright. It like literally burns your eyes to look at it. Ooh man, that brightened it up a lot. It's not bright bright. I mean, it's basically like a couple of candles. I'm probably not doing it right. They probably had a different method. Um, I suppose for back in the 1930s or whatever. <laughs> probably bright enough for that. But uh, I could only find one video on limelights when I was looking them up. So I decided to just give it a try. Because it's kind of an interesting attribute of one of these torches. Definitely super bright. That's the torch we're doing that with. That whole rock's getting red hot there. Yeah, this thing's gonna blind me before it's over. Just know what to do about that. Extremely hard to do this without burning your eyes out completely. I have a lens here. To find it. In case you've ever wondered what a real limelight actually looks like, have you ever heard the term in the limelight? Well, basically in the old days they used to shoot a hydrogen flame onto a piece of lime and it would glow to incandescence. I essentially have a uh, hydrogen torch propped up here, burning a hole under the side of a piece of fire brick there. Not very bright at all. However, that is an actual limelight. I noticed there's no video that I could find of a limelight anywhere. So I was compelled to uh, kind of show what it, will be, what it does. It is bright and it can get brighter than this. I'm probably going blind doing this. This is a 10 watt or 10 amp AC at 120 volts, so quite a bit of power with like literally no light to show for it. I'm trying not to blow myself up at the same time here. So back in the old days when they first started making a lot of hydrogen gas and stuff, that was uh, that was their scheme. Definitely burning a hole in that fire brick right there. I also wanted to share something else with you guys. That is hot. I can feel the heat just kicking off of that. Pretty much blinded myself just setting up for that. Anyway, I've been doing a lot of research, guys, on foaming in industrial processes and I recently switched my electrolyte over to potassium hydroxide because some youtubers had told me that potassium hydroxide does not cause foam well turns out potassium hydroxide even pure food grade caused more foam than my sodium hydroxide electrolytes ever did so I drained that stuff out of there I'm now running oil as an anti-foaming agent this is uh very thin spindle bearing oil now the literature that i've been reading says that they put wax in this oil also paraffin wax um, they have other oils they like to use kerosene and stuff like that but i can't have combustibles in here messing up my flame so i'm only going to use oils Silicone oil is the best. However, the silicone spray that I have has other substances in it. So it doesn't count as silicone. 
as you can see here, it's probably still full of foam. Well, it isn't now. This is silicone spray, but uh, it was awfully full of foam. I may still try this, but I think what I'd rather do is just get some actual silicone oil, some pure silicone oil, because that stuff has rust inhibitors in it. And you can't just go throwing anything into an electrolyzer, fellas. Um, very complex organic chemicals are actually manufactured through the electrolysis process in systems like this. So just thinking you can throw just anything in here and you're not going to get any secondary reactions is very uninformed. I've, I've been researching electrolysis for 10 years and have read quite a bit of information on the subject. And um, back in the old days, they would make all types of exotic chemicals. Hydrogen peroxide is one of them. And what they would do is they would alter the size ratio of the anode versus the cathode. For example, they would have this massive cathode in a real tiny little wire anode. Changing the electrode size ratio can alter the reactions you get. So this electrolysis of water process is not as cut and dry as some of these HHO enthusiasts have uh, led one to believe. It's actually a lot more actual science going on um, I don't believe in hooking this stuff up to a car this is not one of those videos do not hook an HHO machine up to your car please spare yourself but at any rate guys so far this oil is working as a very good defoaming agent um, I do have the piezoelectric transducer in place the offside transducer this driver circuit just not very good it's not powerful enough um, ultrasonic transducers do not remove foam guys I have several videos on me attempting to use it for that now there are some devices that can operate externally perhaps if I put a horn on this it would work better but um, for the most part the piezoelectric transducer isn't helping anything with my pumps even it's just not enough power it has a small effect, but uh, just can't wait to get a more powerful driver, like a 20 watt, watt driver or something like that. So the one thing that I'm thinking is a lot of that has to do with this foaming is this tubing. It's gotta be the tubing because I've read some chemical compatibility charts and polyethylene is only a, a, a C, I think, on the compatibility, or a B, I'm sorry. Which means it does have a slight effect on it, the sodium hydroxide solution. I think that's where the soapification is coming from. Because when you run the system brand new, with just a new electrolyte, it doesn't foam at all. Not a bit. Over time, however, it achieves this very foamy attribute. Which is leading me to believe um, there's some type of secondary reaction taking place with the polyethylene tubing that I'm using. Things are starting to foam up a little bit here more than they normally were. I might want to uh, put some more foaming or some more oil in there. This thing has not been running for a long enough time to determine whether or not the oil has worked at all. However, it does appear to have an effect. Oh crap. I just turned the torch off without turning my torch off. This part of it. <laughs> We about got to see a flashback there. You can see that transducer does uh, clear things up quite quickly in there. It's just not powerful enough. Definitely got some foam crap going on, but the oil seems to be working a little bit. Not 100%, but uh, I'll let you know how it goes. I'm still battling this foam thing after years. I have a system set up here with this secondary catch that does work for most jobs that I do. But as far as using the same electrolyte for like, it's like a year old, you just can't do it. It's just too much foam. And I uh, wanted to give the oil a try. Just thought I'd show you guys what it looks like. And so far, so good. I mean, we do get a lot of foam. But uh, hopefully it doesn't start foaming over on itself like it does.
Let's hope for that. But that's where I am just fooling around with this thing tonight. Just got done reading about the oil being used for the old uh, anti-foaming agents in industrial processes and just had to come out here and give it a try. It's like midnight, so <laughs> nice and cool in here at least, but uh, nonetheless, that's where we are. The oil seems to be helping. I might have to put more in there though. I need to get some silicone oil and try that. They seem to be saying the silicone oil is the best. Do not put the foaming agent in these things.